வணக்கம் டு யூ நோ த பேசிக்ஸ் அபவுட் ஸ்வான் நெக் டிஃபார்மிட்டி இன் த ஃபிங்கர் எஸ் அஃப்கோர்ஸ் வாட் இஸ் திஸ் டிஃபார்மிட்டி ஹைப்பர் எக்ஸ்டென்ஷன் அட் த ப்ராக்சிமல் இன்டர்ஃபினான்ஷியல் ஜாயிண்ட் அண்ட் ஃப்ளெக்ஷன் அட் த டிஸ்டல் இன்டர்ஃபினான்ஷியல் ஜாயிண்ட் இஸ் இட் காஸ்ட் பை அ ப்ராப்ளம் இன் த டிஸ்டல் இன்டர்ஃபினான்ஷியல் ஜாயிண்ட் ஆ எஸ் or is it caused by a problem in the proximal interphalangeal joint yes or is it caused by a problem in the metacarpophalangeal joint can it be caused by a mallet finger injury yes definitely can it be caused by rheumatoid arthritis yes can it be caused in burns can it be caused after tendon transfer Oh come let us learn about this one neck deformity fully and clearly in this video we are going to learn about the swan neck deformity with regards to the etiology the pathoanatomy and mechanics the clinical evaluation and the treatment the deformity as such consists of flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint hyper extension at the proximal interphalangeal joint and sometimes it may be associated with the flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint also the deformity is called the swan neck deformity due to its similarity to the configuration of the neck of the swan the conditions in which this deformity presents are quite varied it may actually be physiological in some people who have hyperextensile proximal interphalangeal joints due to volar plate laxity trauma can cause swan neck deformity in different conditions like a mallet finger injury to the volar plate or the flexor distrum superficialis loss untreated sagittal band injury or burns swan neck deformity can very commonly occur in rheumatoid arthritis it can also occur after certain surgical procedures like harvest of the flexor digitorum superficialis tendon or in claw correction procedures where the tensioning has been too tight for achieving metacarpophalangeal joint flexion in certain conditions like cerebral palsy folkman ischemic contracture too swan neck deformity can be noted how is it that such varied etiologies cause the same deformity basically this deformity consists of involvement of the distal interphalangeal joint proximal interphalangeal joint and metacarpophalangeal joint of the finger at the distal interphalangeal joint there is flexion this flexion could be caused as a result of either weakness of extension or too much of flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint there is extension this extension deformity could be caused either by too much of extension force or lesser force of flexion in the same way the metacarpophalangeal joint is flexed this flexion could be caused either by weakness of extension power or too much of flexion power with this new insight let us see what is the mechanism causing the swan neck deformity in the different etiologies that we have seen in the physiological swan neck deformity it is the weakness of flexion power at the proximal interphalangeal joint due to congenital volar plate laxity in a mallet finger injury which leads on to the swan neck deformity it is weakness of extension at the distal interphalangeal joint that starts the process of formation of the swan neck we shall soon be seeing how this happens when there is an injury to the volar plate or flexor digitorum superficialis loss the mechanism of formation of the swan neck is weakness of flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint and when there is an untreated sagittal band injury over the metacarpophalangeal joint it is weakness of extension at the metacarpophalangeal joint that results in the deformity in burns when there is a scar over the dorsal aspect of the proximal interphalangeal joint this scar causes too much of extension at the proximal interphalangeal joint which results in the swan neck deformity rheumatoid arthritis can affect any of the joints that we have seen and similarly post surgical conditions like harvest of the flexor digitorum superficialis or too tight tensioning of the claw correction 
can also be caused by involvement of the mechanics of different joints. Finally, we need to understand that in conditions like cerebral palsy and Folkman's ischemic contracture, it is the contracture of the intrinsic muscles that causes too much of flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint resulting in the swan neck deformity. So, summing up, we find that the swan neck deformity could be caused by loss of extension power in a mallet injury, too much of extension power at the proximal interphalangeal joint in a burn scar, weakness of flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint in conditions like loss of the FDS, loss of the volar plate or laxity of the volar plate, weakness of extension at the metacarpophalangeal joint due to an untreated sagittal band injury or rheumatoid arthritis or increasing flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint due to various forces like ischemic muscle contracture or tight claw correction. So, primarily the pathology may be in one or two joints, but all the three joints of the finger ultimately get affected something like this, where there is a train accident and the coaches collapse. Now let us try to understand how this collapse occurs in the finger by looking at the mechanics involved in the different etiologies. The development of the swan neck in a mallet injury has got three basic mechanisms. First, the power of extension at the distal interphalangeal joint is lost due to the injury to the terminal tendon. There is an unopposed action of the flexor digitorum profundus which is inserted at the base of the terminal phalanx. This is the first power that causes flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint. The second mechanism is that the forces of extension being transmitted from the long extensors and the intrinsic muscles are now concentrated wholly on the proximal interphalangeal joint as the tendon over the distal interphalangeal joint has been injured. This increased extension force at the proximal interphalangeal joint causes the hyperextension at this joint. When this deformity continues, the lateral bands that are normally on the side of the finger now translocate to the dorsal aspect and hence ultimately move dorsal to the joint axis of the proximal interphalangeal joint. So now they add to the extension force at the proximal interphalangeal joint completely establishing the swan neck deformity. Now let us understand how a proximal interphalangeal joint problem can cause a swan neck deformity. There are two forces that counteract the extension force that is occurring at the proximal interphalangeal joint. They are the volar plate and the flexor digitorum superficialis. When the volar plate is weakened, as in conditions like laxity, injury or loss, the forces of extension become stronger at the proximal interphalangeal joint. Similarly, when the force of flexion provided by the flexor digitorum superficialis is lost either by injury or removal at surgery, the extension force at the proximal interphalangeal joint becomes stronger. Similarly, let us consider the mechanics at the metacarpophalangeal joint. Increased force of flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint can cause the swan neck deformity and this increased force could be due to injury to the sagittal band Folkman's ischemic contracture, too tight a claw correction procedure or rheumatoid arthritis. When we talk about rheumatoid arthritis, this is a condition which can affect any of the three joints that we have considered so far. The way it affects the metacarpophalangeal joint is quite characteristic. Due to increased forces on the ulnar side, there is a guttering of the extensors on the ulnar side. This is further aggravated by erosion of the radial side sagittal band. As the extensor tendon gutters deeper and deeper on the ulnar side of the metacarpophalangeal joint, ultimately it lies volar to the axis of the joint. Hence it almost becomes a flexor of the joint. Because of the now shortened path of the extensors, the intrinsics that are attaching to the extensors also become shortened.
and the contracture of these intrinsics exaggerates their action that is metacarpophalangeal joint flexion and interphalangeal joint extension. The typical intrinsic plus deformity rheumatoid arthritis can also affect the proximal interphalangeal joint by causing erosion of the volar plate or rupture of the flexor digitorum superficialis resulting in the swan neck and it can also affect the distal interphalangeal joint by causing attrition of the terminal tendon resulting in the characteristic deformity caused in rheumatoid arthritis of flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint, extension at the proximal interphalangeal joint and flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint. When a patient presents with a swan neck deformity, we need to find exactly which joint the pathology started. A thorough history is very important as a mallet finger deformity can be elicited even from the history. Physical examination to determine where the pathology started will entail evaluating the distal proximal interphalangeal joints and the metacarpophalangeal joints. To determine whether the intrinsic muscles are tight, we need to perform the bunnell test and also evaluate the range of motion of the three joints. In the intrinsic tightness test, when we hold the patient's metacarpophalangeal joint in extension, he will not be able to flex the proximal interphalangeal joint or he will find it difficult to flex the proximal interphalangeal joint. However, when the metacarpophalangeal joint is kept flexed, he will be able to very easily flex the proximal interphalangeal joint. This is indicative of tightness of the intrinsics. Based on our examination, we will find that there are four types of swan neck deformities classified by Nalibuff et al. Type 1 is where the proximal interphalangeal joint is flexible and independent of metacarpophalangeal joint position. That is, Bunnell's test is negative and this type usually occurs due to palmar plate failure at the proximal interphalangeal joint which may or may not be associated with failure of the flexor digitorum superficialis. In type 2, the proximal interphalangeal joint flexibility is dependent on the metacarpophalangeal joint position that is the intrinsic muscles are tight where the Bunnell's test is positive. In type 3 swan neck, the proximal interphalangeal joint is stiff regardless of the metacarpophalangeal joint position and in type 4, the proximal interphalangeal joint has been destroyed. Before we consider the treatment of the swan neck deformity, we need to recognize one important point that is the swan neck deformity is more debilitating than the boutonniere deformity because the fingers cannot be flexed into the palm for grasping objects. Hence, treating a swan neck deformity is very essential and important. But since there are so many etiologies that can cause the deformity, treatment of the cause of the problem is most important. Like whether it is due to the mallet finger, burns, volar plate laxity or rheumatoid arthritis. And in conditions of rheumatoid arthritis, the treatment plan will vary according to the stage of the disease as classified by Nalibuff. The swan neck deformity may be obvious in a mallet injury either immediately or later depending on the laxity of the volar plate of the proximal interphalangeal joint. In the acute situation, if there is a swan neck deformity, correction of the mallet finger itself will treat this condition and prevent a swan neck from occurring. But in a chronic mallet deformity, we need to assess the passive range of movement at the distal interphalangeal joint. If there is a contracture, we need to splint it. If there is no improvement on splinting, a surgical release consisting of arthrolysis and tenolysis needs to be done. If there is still no improvement and there is evidence of bony involvement, arthrodesis of the distal interphalangeal joint should be done. If there is no contracture at the distal interphalangeal joint, we need to assess the angle. This measurement is described in detail in the video on mallet finger injury which you can access by clicking on the icon above. If this angle is less than 30 degrees, 
the procedures of tenodermodesis, abbreviato procedure or the tendon advancement procedures can be done. But if the angle is more than 30 degrees, either a Fowler's tenotomy or an oblique retinacular ligament reconstruction needs to be done. The Fowler's tenotomy for swan neck deformity consists of tenotomy of the central slip. This will lead to rebalancing of the extensor mechanism to increase the extension force at the DIP joint. In the spiral oblique retinacular ligament reconstruction or the SORL reconstruction, a palmaris longus tendon graft is used to restrain the PIP joint extension and to extend the DIP joint at the same time. The tendon graft is fixed to the distal phalanx by a pull-out suture. It is then passed between the flexor tendon and the palmar plate of the proximal interphalangeal joint and put into an osseous tunnel in the proximal phalanx. And this is the general scheme of this procedure. Treatment of swan neck deformity arising in a burn scar is quite straightforward. But certain principles need to be followed. The skin contracture needs to be released with excision of the scar and skin grafting. The excision must cross the neutral line on both sides of the finger to avoid a recontracture. It is important to immobilize with flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint for a minimum of 10 days to 2 weeks. The swan neck splint must be applied with intermittent mobilization for a period of not less than 3 months. When the swan neck deformity occurs due to a laxity in the volar plate, the treatment consists of strengthening the flexion force at the proximal interphalangeal joint. This can be achieved by the sublimis sling procedure, which also causes a PIP extension block. One slip of the FDS is harvested, taken through a small window in the flexor tendon sheath and sutured to itself near the insertion. This procedure prevents extension of the proximal interphalangeal joint beyond 20 degrees. As mentioned earlier, the treatment of the swan neck deformity occurring in rheumatoid arthritis depends on the type of the deformity. When it is a type 1 deformity, there is only PIP or DIP involvement and there is no involvement of the metacarpophalangeal joint. A splinting, a dermadesis procedure, FDS sling or sublimis sling or SORL reconstruction needs to be done to address the PIP joint problem, but the DIP joint problem needs to be addressed only with a DIP fusion. In type 2 swan neck, there is limited PIP joint movement in some positions. So, an intrinsic release or arthroplasty of the metacarpophalangeal joint needs to be done and the proximal interphalangeal joint and distal interphalangeal joint may be addressed in the same way as for type 1. In type 3 deformity, the proximal interphalangeal joint movement is limited in all positions. Hence, the metacarpophalangeal joint needs to be addressed as in type 2, but the PIP joint must be released in the skin and lateral band mobilization procedure needs to be done. In type 4 deformity, since there are arthritic changes, arthroplasty of the metacarpophalangeal joint and PIP fusion and DIP fusion are ideal. We have seen some of these procedures already, we shall see the remaining now. In type 1 deformity, the silver ring splint plays an important role in preventing PIP joint hyperextension while at the same time allowing PIP joint flexion. This may be made with silver or with molded plastic. The procedures for type 2 deformity like the sublimis sling or the SORL reconstruction have been described earlier. For type 3 deformity where there is a stiffness of the proximal interphalangeal joint, the main aim of treatment consists of converting this proximal interphalangeal joint into a flexible joint that is a type 2 deformity. This can be achieved either by serial casting or surgical release and the surgical release consists of two important procedures, the lateral band mobilization in which the spaces between the center slip and the lateral bands are released 
and the lateral bands are allowed to move volarward so that passive proximal interphalangeal joint flexion will be possible. If the skin over the proximal interphalangeal joint is also tight, this will have to be released by an incision like this and after flexing the proximal interphalangeal joint, this wound can be sutured proximally and the distal end left to heal by secondary intention with adequate splinting. In type 4 involvement, the joints are destroyed. However, it is not ideal to do an arthrodesis of the metacarpophalangeal joint as the movements are very important. Hence, a metacarpophalangeal joint arthroplasty is ideal and there are many methods of doing this. But as far as the proximal interphalangeal joint is concerned, an arthrodesis is ideal and it is the same with the distal interphalangeal joint where the arthrodesis can be done by different techniques. I hope you liked the video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more about other zones of extensor tendon injury and their management. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery, plastic surgery and trauma surgery. Manakkam.